Welcome to a very special edition of the Nuclear Medicine Molecular Medicine Podcast, the world's longest running medical podcast. And we're going to be speaking to some people from one of the most scientifically special places in the world, which is Lund in Sweden. And we've done podcasts from there before um, and uh, on, on, with some amazing people. They do fantastic work in Sweden. No question about it. So what well, we're at the International Alzheimer's Meeting here in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, and, um, and the premier imaging prize that comes is the De Leon Prize. And this was awarded to, uh, well, really to the whole team. Would that be a fair, fair comment, yeah. right? Three, yeah. yes. Three prizes. So. Three prizes, right? So um, perhaps we could uh, start by just introducing yourselves. Tell us a little bit about yourselves. Okay, so my name is uh, Michael Quote, and um, I'm, a, I'm a, a research scientist living in Seville in Spain, actually. Yeah. So I, I collaborate a lot with, uh, and I'm a big fan of Lund. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, um, I, actually, my, I work at the Institute of Biomedicine of Seville in southern Spain. Beautiful um, place. Yeah. And it's not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I, uh, my did a lot of research in And they shot Game of Thrones there, right? Sorry? Game of Thrones they shot there. Yeah, I've been to the actual place the, where they did ah, At the Alcázar. Oh, exactly. Alcázar of know Sevilla. That. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Alice Alcázar. <laughs> That's where they shot part of uh, Game of Thrones. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, and besides that, besides part of Thrones, we do uh, some science there too. And um, <laughs> uh, neuroimaging focused science in my case, especially. Yes. And I'm... Um, I'm leading the neuroimaging core of a movement disorders group, actually, but um, oh. I developed most of my research and uh, was like focused on Alzheimer's disease and neuroimaging and Alzheimer's disease. And that's also how uh, I got to get this prize, right? Right. It's great. Well, when we do Alpha's Nuclean down the track, uh, you'll be able to do the uh, movement disorders yeah. stuff, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm prepared. <laughs> <laughs> right. And Alexa? Yes. I'm Alexa Pshevinet. I'm originally from Montreal. I did my PhD at McGill University, and now I'm a postdoc in Sweden, uh, in Lund, with uh, Oscar. Um, so I let Oscar introduce the Swedish part, and uh, I did a lot of uh, multimodal imaging uh, using MRI and PET uh, in my PhD, and also now in the postdoc, also uh, adding some component of looking at the fluid biomarkers, also in relation with AD pathology. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So my name is Oscar Hansson, I'm a professor of neurology, so I'm a clinician, uh, I see patients. Um, and I started out with Huntington and Parkinson's disease actually a long time ago, yes. doing experimental research, but then went more into dementia diseases and more uh, fluid biomarkers, cerebrospinal fluid biomarkers originally, and then PET imaging for amyloid and tau, and, and lately then more uh, plasma biomarkers as well. So we are running the different biopharma studies at the university. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so there's been a lot of famous studies come out, come out of it. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, the prizes that you, you've won today? Okay, so that's, uh, as you already said, it's the De Leon Prize for Neuromaging. And what is awarded is the best paper in the field of neuromaging uh, in the field of AD dementia and related dementias. And um, yeah, so that's three different categories the trainee category, the uh, junior scientist category, and the senior scientist category. And, and they're all here. <laughs> We're all here. <laughs> you got all of us. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, so tell me about so, what you did. So I did a study uh, focused on FDG PET. Like it's, um, now it's all about amyloid and tau PET these days, but, um, and people are not so much interested in FDG PET anymore, maybe. But um, we do think that it has uh, still a very great uh, diagnostic utility, especially for differential diagnosis, based on the observation that different dementia types have uh, different patterns of hypermetabolism, uh, different cortical regions affected. And we wanted to exploit this, uh, this property of FDG PET and of the different dementia types to see if we could use that for differential diagnosis between AD dementia and uh, limbic age-related TDB. Right, like, which, is, which is really common. It's uh, what, uh, 30% of age dementia people have it? It's something a like lot that. of them, yeah. Yes. It depends on the age. The higher, since it's so frequent, it's a frequent neuropathology of very advanced age. So the higher you get into the age range, the more likely it is you're actually looking at uh, late than at AD dementia. Right. And we don't yet have a, 
uh, uh, pet tracer for TDP43. Exactly. So we're still, waiting. We're still not waiting. even a blood biomarker or a CSF biomarker, nothing. Nothing. So the only we're back to the old FDG scan. And so exactly. And it turned out it it, it does a quite decent job. Yeah. So it's uh, we we first defined kind of an FDG pet signature of late using autopsy confirmed cases, anti mortem FDG pet of autopsy confirmed cases with late contrasted them to autopsy confirmed AD dementia cases and then we knew what we were looking for and sent, then we screened a large cohort of clinically diagnosed suspected AD dementia cases uh, to look for those cases who may have a hypermetabolic pattern that's actually more suggestive of late than of AD. Right, and this is to do with the uh, medial lateral areas of the temporal lobe? and things. Exactly, like so both diseases affect the medial temporal areas but late is much more specific for the medial temporal areas, whereas Alzheimer's disease also affect these temporal parietal, lateral temporal parietal areas. And this is based on these differences in patterns, you can uh, differentiate between these two diseases. And basically what we did in this study was first showing in these autopsy confirmed cases that there are different patterns, and then we use these different patterns to to stratify an in vivo cohort of patients and, and demonstrated that it has uh, that these patients with uh, patterns suggestive of late instead of AD show very different clinical features right. and and genetic features uh, that are more consistent with underlying late neuropathology than with AD actually. Yeah, excellent. So so what did you do, Alexa? So Michelle said that everyone is uh, doing Amrit and Tau, and so not so originally. <laughs> I work, the work we did was mostly focused on Tau, um, especially with a lot of new uh, fluid biomarkers to try to look at different epitopes of phosphorylated Tau. And uh, here we also wanted to really take advantage of more longitudinal data. And so trying to better understand how uh, we have amulet in the brain and then the accumulation of soluble form of p tau. But how does this relate with the actual aggregation of the insoluble tau aggregates that we can measure with uh, longitudinal tau pet data? And also then how this leads to cognitive decline also over time. And so to do this, we looked first in the um, people that are not demented, so cognitively unimpaired or with mild cognitive impairment. And there we saw that really this soluble p tau was really a key driver to facilitate further aggregation of the insoluble tau. And both these tau measures were related to cognitive decline, so already in this uh, pre-dementia stage. So suggesting that if we can reduce the soluble p-tau, that could be maybe a good idea to try to um, stop or uh, delay cognitive decline. Right, because, because traditionally, or at least the fluid biomarkers, we've thought that they've been related to amyloid accumulation rather than tau, right? So, so by looking at that relationship, we can see where, how, how it relates to the, to, and using the PET to see the ta tail tangles, because exactly. you can't really see the exactly. ta tail tangles, you yes. can combine the two. Yeah, definitely. Oh. And then the other part of the study was to try to see in the later stage of the disease, in the AD dementia, do we see these same types of relationship? And then um, there what is driving the cognitive decline was not at all the, the soluble form, but really this aggregation of the ensemble tau that we measured with tau pet. So potentially in this later stages of the disease, when the soluble levels have plateaued, then this is really trying to stop the aggregation of the insoluble form could uh, potentially exert maybe greater clinical benefit to be right. seen, of course. This is still uh, speculative. Right, but it's, it's going to be difficult to get rid of the, the tau insoluble. It's inside the cells, right? So it's going to be tricky to get hold of and tricky to get rid of. Amyloid plaques, a bit easier because yeah. it's outside yeah. the cells, right? Yeah, and, but different and tau therapies tau can is potentially outside. target different forms. So if we think of when could be the best time to uh, try these different therapies, right. maybe it could be at different stages of the disease. Right, because at this time, the amyloid therapies are the only things that seem to be working at reducing tau, right? True, true. Not yeah. the tau therapies. No, 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 yeah, yeah, right, right, definitely. Right, so, so that's a challenge in a conundrum. So the better the understanding of that, the better. So, Oscar, what did you do? Yeah, what did I do? You can uh, also, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we had a, a paper that was actually born out of the Journal Club. Um, we were like discussing a paper from an international working group um, that claimed that you cannot diagnose Alzheimer's disease before the patient has symptoms. Uh. Uh, but then, of course, you have an NIA criteria claiming that if you have amyloid and tau in the brain, you can't say it's Alzheimer's disease. Right. So after that, uh, Journal Club, we decided to try to do a large international study. So 
different research group that had been doing amyloid uh, PET scans and tau PET scans in cognitively normal people, who, and also who had had um, a longitudinal uh, follow-up data on them. Yes. So we collected data from from a lot of different cohorts and did some type of meta-analysis to see yeah. if you have both amyloid and tau in your brain, but still cognitively normal, what will happen to you? Right. So we looked at absolutely cognitively normal, yes. completely normal people. Exactly. This is absolutely prodromal disease. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And and lots of people say, oh no, it doesn't work. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the amyloid doesn't really lead to dementia. Well, yeah, yeah. And tau doesn't lead to me. Exactly. It, it does. Yes, right? it, it does. <laughs> it was, I think it was very clear. If you had both amyloid, but even if you just had a tiny amount of tau signal in the mid temporal lobe, more than fifty percent progress to my cognitive impairment would be in three years. Right. So. To us, I think that supports more the idea that you can actually diagnose Alzheimer's disease since we have both uh, evidence of amyloid and tau for PET imaging, yes. even if you're cognitively normal, I would say. Right, and um, but you also um, highlighted the importance of topographic analysis yes. of the tau image exactly. so that the medial temporal lobes really are important in yes. driving that final stage it's of the right? Exactly. For some people say that if you just have some signal in the medial temporal lobe, it doesn't really matter, but I think this, this study really shows it does now. Yes. Uh, so it's very important. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Well, that's that's some great results. Anything else you'd like to add? I don't know. Maybe so I'm I'm quite biased, I would say, but <laughs> I think that um, I would add that um, more like people should try to focus again more of what's what what's established. So in my case, that's FTG pad. Yes. It has it has been used for differential dementia diagnosis for years, and especially like based on differential patterns. But then people already for, well, forgot about it again or just it was not so much on the map again and um, related to this I think um, to, the, to the I think more focus on FTG pad in general research and uh, in the clinic um, we really should think more about uh, comorbid disease uh, comorbid pathologies right. or it's not all about it's not all Alzheimer's disease right. it's all it's dementia it's bad but it's it, and a lot of it is, is caused by Alzheimer's disease, but not all of it. And there are mm. significant portions, especially like if you go, for example, into a higher age range, then um, then you may actually, the, the, the patients may actually suffer from a different disease, which uh, all these new exciting uh, therapies that are emerging right now for Alzheimer's disease won't do anything. Right. And and the other point is that it's a, it's a readily available. It's approved in Australia, for example, uh, and it's paid for. So it's, it's something that, that you do. The important thing is that it's an old therapy, that an old imaging technique that's useful, and yet there's been studies of this paper, things like white matter hypothesis are not that useful. So it's a different kind of, uh, a different kind of pet imaging as a, as a supplement and mm. as adding value. When people looked at white matter hypertensities, they didn't add a lot of value to the pet imaging but adding the FTG adds a different diagnosis of a different disease, right? I don't think so. Mm. True, true. Yes. Simply because of, because it's so consistent that different dementia types are associated with different patterns on the FTG. And that's even if we're talking about really similar clinical syndromes, as in late oh. versus AD, which are both amnestic dementia, oh, both clinically diagnosed as AD dementia, but you still see these differences on an FTG pattern. Yeah. Hmm. Anything else? Mm -hmm. No, no, Michelle's uh, wise <laughs> word. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah, but I'm still, I'm still very excited for, of course, different methods for the other proteinopathies. Now, um, I think what we're seeing now, papa synuclein ah, uh, yes. seeding aggregation assays in, yes. in, in, uh, is extremely promising. Yes. Of course, we would love to see a pet tracer for yes. papa synuclein uh, pathologies. Yeah. Uh, with or TDP43. TDP, yeah. definitely. And, yeah. and also, of course, 4R and 3R tau. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think uh, I think a lot we will see a lot of things happening in in the coming years in this area. So yeah, say. excellent. Uh, we're, we're living in very interesting times, but interesting in a really positive way. Yeah, yeah. Because a lot of these, I mean, let's face it, the therapies that we're now succeeding in Alzheimer's disease would not have happened if it wasn't for imaging, right? Definitely, definitely. In I, fact, I they amended them yeah, yeah, before yeah. we did the PET scans. Then PET scans have sort of brought these therapies back to life. So the, how many AD dementia patients uh, who were included in these first phase three trials uh, hmm. of who, who never had AD? Who yeah. never had a PET scan, who yeah, yeah. Fi were found later yeah. when they had an amyloid PET scan to not have exactly. amyloid yeah. actually. About I think it was 20, 30, yeah, the, 30 yeah, or yeah. it was a, yeah. an absurdly high uh, percentage yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of patients being 
treated with anti-amyloid antibodies exactly. without yeah. having amyloid. Yeah. 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 We need a biomarker in living people to measure stuff. Yeah. Don't just throw a th therapeutic without measuring anything. Exactly. Yes. We need to also show target engagement very early on. Though, Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. For, yeah. Great. Well, okay. thank you so much. And, and congratulations, all of you, for, for, for the Leon Prize. Amazing stuff. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. So thank much. you. Yeah. Thank